Good morning. Welcome everyone, both in the room and virtually, on this remarkably sunny day in Bristol. This is the fourth breakfast panel debate this year from Arup, um, and it's the first one to be in partnership with BCO. My name is Charlotte Aikerman, and I head up the project management team in Bristol for CBRE, as well as being an active member of the South West and South Wales BCO committee. I'm really pleased to have been asked to chair today's debate as it's on such a current topic and challenge for us all when considering our built assets and their impact on our environment. So today's question, net zero carbon, is it the death of good design? We're also hoping that the panelists' presentations today will spark some interesting questions for you. For those in the room, a simple raise of the hand at the right time will be perfect. And for those online, there is a live Q&A um, chat already open for those burning questions. I'll do my very best to ensure that we put as many of those questions to the panel uh, today. So coming on to our panelists. So my background is across all sectors with particular focus on office and residential, advising investors, developers and occupiers. I started my career studying building surveying at the locally renowned UWE and gained professional accreditation with the RACS. I spent eight years in London before relocating to Bristol to set up the project management specialism for CBRE in 2016. I'm currently working on a number of office refurbishments within Bristol with a key driver for sustainability and focus on minimising both embodied and operational carbon. Claire Wilding is a principal structural engineer at Arup Cardiff with a focus on sustainable building design. She studied, uh, she studied architectural engineering at Cardiff University and is chartered with the Institute of Structural Engineers. Claire has a broad experience designing structures ranging in scale from domestic to large city centre redevelopments. This experience includes historic buildings, refurbishment and new timber structures, which all continue to be areas of interest. She is knowledgeable on embodied carbon and whole life, whole life carbon and is a certified passive house, house designer. She leads initiatives within her team to promote learning and drive improvement in sustainable design. John Wright is an architect and, and director at Stride to Glown. He leads the talented team at Stride's Bristol office, provides board level leadership for ESG and maintains in involvement in commercial and workplace projects. John is actively involved with the BCO as vice chair of the South West and South Wales chapter committee and a member of the National ESG committee and was a speaker at the One Day Conference in 2021 on the subject Net Zero Carbon Buildings, Reality or Cleverly Constructed Mirage. Hopefully helpful added today. <laughs> Stephen is an Associate Director in the Buildings, uh, buildings Sustainability Team at Arup. He specialises in sustainability strategy for property portfolios, master plans and building developments with the particular focus on carbon emissions. His experience spans across both developments and asset management. Stephen is passionate about connecting corporate sustainability strategy with real world outcomes, both for people and the environment. He is Arup's representative on the BCO ESG committee and is qualified independent design reviewer for the Neighbours UK energy rating scheme. So without further ado, I will pass you over to Claire. Is net zero carbon the death of de design? Well, I certainly don't think so. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it actually normally improves building design. Lots of you probably watched David Attenborough's speech at COP26 last year. It's worth finding on YouTube if you haven't. I found it really motivational and a reminder of why we must reduce carbon in our atmosphere. Now, as he explains, it's all about this number that's um, shared on the screen. Uh, it's the parts per million of carbon in the air. And when we talk about net zero carbon buildings, we're talking about buildings that don't add to that number. So that's both in their construction and the materials, so the embodied carbon and the energy used in its lifetime, which we refer to as the operational, card, um, operational carbon. And it used to be that the, uh, the embodied was kind of insignificant compared to the energy use, but that's kind of switching now um, as energy, um, buildings become more energy efficient. Um, so we, we need to consider both. What is good design? I'll give my opinion on that. Maybe people have differing ones, which we'll hear later. Um, aesthetics are a part of design, and I think beauty and beautiful surroundings have a really positive impact on us and our well-being. But design has to be more than just looks. Um, we need to consider how well something fulfills its purpose and what resources are needed to achieve that. And what is the purpose of a building? 
First and foremost, they are shelters. They provide people with protection from the elements and should create a comfortable internal environment. If we design buildings from the inside out with this user comfort um, as a priority, we should be on the way to achieving good functionality. And then combine that with responding to location, uh, the local climate, the surroundings, the materials available. And I think we should also achieve efficient and attractive design. We've come a long, a long way since those first basic shelters, maybe too far. To agree that net zero carbon is the death of good design would mean that we think we were previously achieving good design just before we started counting carbon. I think advances in technology such as air conditioning and lifts have actually led us further away from good design, um, or at least my definition of it. When we construct buildings this tall, um, this uses a disproportionate amount of materials for the space it provides. We get dramatic skylines, but the actual buildings look very similar from cities around the world, and perhaps that's actually a little bit boring. Lack of consideration of the local climate means that vast amounts of energy are used to keep the occupants comfortable, um, either in heating or cooling, and sometimes failing to do that with issues of um, overheating and glare. So I don't actually think that buildings of this kind are examples of good design. If that's controversial, let's um, discuss that afterwards. In addition to these design issues, when people live and work in places like this, they can be so disconnected from nature that it's easy to forget about it entirely and ignore the impact that we have on the wider world. Just flipping the question a little bit with this next point, but I think it's interesting to consider not just the impact that net zero carbon has on design, but to also see that design can have an impact on how people prioritise and perceive the environment. Talking of nature, um, it's clearly the best designer we have uh, and a great place to take inspiration. In the natural world, plants and animals have evolved over millions of years to be perfectly adapted to their environment. And you wouldn't expect to see the same animal on the equator as you would in the Arctic. I think this um, adaption, adaptation brings diversity and beauty. And looking back in the history of architecture, somewhere between those Bronze Age roundhouses and the skyscrapers, um, we see greater diversity. I think this gives countries and regions a distinct style, um, unique identity and a sense of place. And these examples are from Iraq, Japan, uh, Italy and the UK. Designers also knew how to use passive design principles and these were closely linked to the building aesthetics. So things like building orientation, thermal mass, natural ventilation and sizing the windows so they're proportioned for good daylight without overheating. Bringing this up to date, passive house design combines these principles with modern materials and appropriate technology to create very low energy buildings, which also have really high levels of internal comfort for the occupants. And that's not just thermal, also really good air quality and acoustics. Passive house buildings are often driven by a desire for net zero energy, but they're also functional, comfortable and attractive. So clearly meeting my definition of what good design is. I've talked mostly so far about operational carbon, but as a structural engineer, a lot of my work has been involved in trying to reduce embodied carbon. Trees are a brilliant example of efficient structures. Their growth is linked to the forces they need to resist, so the self-weight and the wind load. And each branch is a cantilever. It tapers towards its end where the stress is reduced. So using the minimum amount of material to do its function of supporting the, uh, the leaf canopy. When we're working um, in design with the constraints of a carbon target, it can actually lead us to be more creative. Uh, rectilinear columns and beams are actually wasteful in terms of where they put material. And um, I think um, low carbon is actually a driver for us to explore much more interesting forms as well as low carbon materials. Here's just one uh, such example. It's a new mosque in Cambridge, which was completed in 2019. Um, apparently, the underlying idea came from a metaphor of a mosque being um, an oasis or a grove of trees. So it's very literal um, use of uh, tree columns, but there's other examples where it's maybe less organic, um, but still using this principle of, um, kind of efficient use of material and where we put that um, the material. Um, but this example, I think, demonstrates real beauty in a design which is also very low carbon. 
So lots of elements of what I consider good design are improved when we target net zero carbon. So responding to local conditions, being functional, comfortable places and using materials in efficient ways. As I touched on before, a slightly different question to ask, and that is what good design can help us achieve. I think good design has the power to inspire change. Achieving good net zero design carbon buildings should give us the confidence that we can tackle the climate emergency and then provoke further action in our construction industry and beyond it. OK, I'm going to pass over to John for his take on this question. Thank you, Claire. Old school paper notes. I think I've got the um, the short straw probably um, to try and convince you that uh, net zero carbon actually is the death of good design. So I was going to go all um, all arrogant architect with um, a bow tie and Corbusier glasses uh, and bang on about how uh, how design designers imagination should be the only constraint on on good design. I was going to show you um, pictures of skyscrapers in the desert um, where we can create whatever we want to. Perfect internal environments, despite the external uh, harsh external climate where imaginations can run free and we can do whatever we want. I was going to show you pictures of great cathedrals and palaces and you know, opulent country houses and point out the fact that they could never have been designed under net zero carbon constraints. But we wouldn't want to be without those kind of buildings, would we? I was going to point out the fact that um, modern cars are really dull and boring and efficient, whereas old cars, you know, they're fantastic, aren't they? They've got character and style, uh, completely unrestrained by that need for efficiency. But all in the false argument to convince you that net zero carbon um, is the death of good design. But then I thought, hang on, I'm at Stride to Clown, um, where we treat every project as a unique design challenge. Um, with multiple constraints of location and brief and regulation and budget and all those things that drive the design of a building. And where we don't actually have a house style and we're not driven by ego. Uh, so I thought I don't really need to make a false argument, even though I spent half my time using it. Um, because I actually truly believe that buildings that are designed purely to a net zero carbon constraint, where that's the fundamental thing that's driving it, will take all the fun and joy and beauty out of buildings. And you get dull things like this. Apologies to anyone who designed these buildings, but um, they're not very exciting, are they? They're not very, fu very fun. And similarly, if you let Passive House or Bream or some other rating system dictate what you're doing, and you drive everything um, from a spreadsheet, um, like these lovely passive house ones, you just don't, and you don't apply any skill or flair, um, you are gonna get competent, but kind of boring buildings. Just in the same way that if you let um, cost be your main constraint, you're gonna get mean-spirited and boring buildings like those. I've often had conversations um, with a colleague of mine, Rob Delius, who's our head of sustainability, about how I thought it would be possible to design the perfect office environment inside a black box um, and be net zero carbon, something hugely efficient uh, and all obviously powered by green energy. Well, it seems that the guy called Charles Munger in America agrees with me because this is a building he's proposed in Santa Barbara for the University of California, 1.6 million square feet, four and a half thousand student rooms, 90% of which don't have any windows. And if you put that in an office context, I think if you stripped out all those internal walls um, uh, and increase the floor to floor heights a little bit, you would have a perfect environment. You could create the perfect controlled environment with the, the right air temperature and the CO2 and all of that stuff. It'd be wonderful. And for anyone who's boring enough to actually want the view, where you can you could put a an artificial screen in, that's a, a an image from an internal cabin on a cruise ship where you just have a big LED screen um, so you, you can you can see outside. And actually more than aircraft now, the image on the left is a real 777 that Emirates have got where they don't have portholes, they just have a screen of what's outside. But in the future, you can have a really big one. And in an office, you could have a fantastic screen near your, near your desk and have a view out of it anywhere. You don't need to have that boring view of Bristol or London or wherever. You could have a different view every day, uh, every, every minute if you wanted to, you know, constantly fantastic working environment. 
but but seriously would anybody actually want to live or work in an environment like that however um, efficient it might be uh, I certainly wouldn't it would be absolutely horrendous so architects and designers have been working within increasingly complex constraints as time has gone on and if we accept net zero carbon as just another constraint as part of a holistic sustainability requirement uh, and add to all those existing constraints and we work collaboratively as a design team which is critical as well we can create buildings that are truly sustainable because they're delightful people want to live in them they want to work in them now and hopefully in a hundred years time because if that's not the case it's not a sustainable building Vitruvia has defined good design, I always like to go to the classics, as firmness, commodity and delight. But I think you can update that to sustainable, where net zero carbon is part of a rounded, holistic sustainability requirement. Durable in that it will pass the test of time, keep the water out, keep the heat in um, and, and, and still be there in 100 years. And attractive in a way that will bring pleasure to those who use the building, and those who pass by and look at it. So mine's a fairly simple argument. Um, is net zero carbon the death of good design? I think if it is the only thing that you drive um, your design by, yes, it must be the death of it. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Stephen. OK, thank you, John. <coughs> OK, good morning, everybody. So we've had it. We've had a yes and we've had a no. So I'm going with a maybe. Um, those who know me, I don't often sit on the fence, but you know, just for a change. Um, so I think, yeah, I think the death of it needs to be the death of some kinds of good design, but it also needs to be the birth of responsible design. And actually, that that's the thing I'm going to focus a bit on. Um, so this this I guess is an example of what we've we've previously considered good, even iconic design. But I think this is the good design that we do need to see the death of. This is good design in an unconstrained uh, sense, not really worried about the amount of material you use or the energy efficiency, but putting an, an aesthetic quality over the top of all of that. Um, and that's in you know, that's, a, that's a, a, a building example of the same thing. This is the CCTV building in, in Beijing, which Arab had a, had a role in uh, quite a few years ago. And this is a building that clearly puts a, quite an imposing aesthetic um, ahead of material efficiency and energy efficiency with those um, quite fantastic cantilevers. So again, this this is the kind of good design that I think we do we do need to leave behind, and I think there's a there's a sense that this is starting to happen. I, the industry, as you know, has really kind of embraced the concept of net zero carbon and is really struggling to understand what it means. Uh, and we're starting to see this this kind of thing come through in the planning process. So this was the tulip that was was proposed as a, a viewing platform in the city of London. Um, it was rejected ultimately in the planning process. And one of the reasons stated for the rejection was the highly unsustainable use of materials, to quote the, to quote the decision. Um, and the interesting thing there, I think, whatever you think about the tulip, and I mean, that's a building that, that a few years ago we might well have considered to be good, even iconic design. Um, but, the, but the fact that the planning, pro, the, the planning decision specifically mentioned the, the material environmental impact, I think, is a real sign of changing times. So. We need to move away from that that kind of historic good design towards more responsible design. And I would say responsible design is not necessarily just about trying to do exactly the same thing in a more efficient way. It's about changing the whole way we go about things. So it's not just you know, it's not just an efficient electric car. It's you know, if I'm continuing with my transport analogy, maybe it's an electric scooter. Um, and I think by that change of, of behavior, we managed to make a, a much bigger step forward towards net zero. So I'm, I'm dabbling in architecture, which is a dangerous thing for an engineer to do. But anyway, um, so I think there are kinds of good design that we can we can embrace and, and that, that are compatible with responsible design. So um, if you think about some of the early 20th century minimalist buildings, um, I think, you know, they, those weren't in themselves efficient buildings. I mean, there's lots of single glazing and cold bridging to your heart's content, but I think that minimalist aesthetic and that principle of form follows function can be reinterpreted in the 20th century to become responsible design. Um, and this is a this is a 20th century example. This is uh, one Finsbury Avenue that was an Arab Associates design from the mid 1980s. And actually, I think this 
this kind of captures some of that sort of understated um, responsible design. So the facade in particular uh, has a series of terraces and access ways with Brie Soleil built in. So it's very well self shaded. It's very efficient, very effective. Um, and this is the kind of the way that we can blend good and responsible design, I think, going forward. <coughs> so we are, uh, this is a partly BCO event. Um, good in the commercial office market has for a long time been defined by the BCO's guide to specification, last updated in 2019. And I think, you know, we all agree that, that quite a lot has happened since then. And I think if you think about the way that that guide has been used, and I'd caveat this, this next bit by saying this is as much about the way that the market has interpreted the guide as to what the guide actually says, but you could you could characterise it as a little bit like a five star hotel. So it gives the office tenant whatever they want, whenever they need it, regardless or whenever they want it, sorry, regardless of whether that's actually what they what they need. So it's a, a kind of unconstrained level of provision, giving you enough capacity for anything you could ever possibly imagine. Um, so at the BCO conference earlier in the month, uh, they published a paper proposing a set of draft updates to a number of key criteria in the 2019 guide. Uh, and there were a large number of people involved in this. I had a small um, role in it working with uh, one of our colleagues, Der one of our clients at Derwent London. Um, and I think if I was to characterise this overall, this is more about more responsible provision. So if, the, if the, the 2019 guide ended up being used a little bit like Claridge's, maybe this is a bit more like the Premier Inn. So it's providing tenants with a robust service, giving them everything they need for comfort, um, but avoiding some of that excess. Um, and actually, this is quite a good example because this is this is also the first hotel in the UK to be battery powered. So the new guide is aiming to provide that level of comfort, but also in a much more environmentally responsive way. Um, I'm not going to go through the individual criteria. I've just picked some of them out on the screen. But I think the interesting thing to note. Um, so there are a whole series of changes that are about improving our whole life carbon impact, as you'd expect, as we kind of journey towards net zero carbon. But there are also some changes um, that are about improving environmental quality. So there's a change to the way that daylighting is specified, um, aligning more with the well standard. Um, there's an improvement in the standard of internal air quality in terms of CO2 levels. And I think this in terms of thinking about how you characterise responsible design, the idea that we are at the same time reducing carbon emissions and improving well-being outcomes and we're looking at that balance between those two things I think is really important. Um, the other thing that is included in the new update is specific targets in terms of operational energy neighbours rating and also embodied uh, embodied carbon um, and of course you know buildings building a building isn't like baking a cake so you, it's not just a question of changing the ingredients on the previous slide and you automatically come up with these outcomes it's far far more complicated than that. But nevertheless, I think the fact that the BCO has included those those target outcomes as part of that definition of good, I think is really important. Um, and the industry is already moving in this direction. So we're already seeing buildings coming forward with some of these criteria. So this is 11 to 12 Wellington Place, which was a, a scheme Arab were involved in in Leeds. It's the first neighbours five star building outside London. And I think, you know, it's a nice looking building. I think it shows that you can you can blend good and responsible um, design. Uh, but to, to finish, I want to go back to White Collar Factory, with, which is an example I've used before. Um, but it does, it is a good example of the fact that responsible design can't just be about carbon. It does have to be about well-being and satisfaction as well. So this building has concrete core, passive cooling, natural ventilation, and a really kind of stripped back minimalist aesthetic. Um, and I think that's that's in that way, White Collar Factory manages to blend this issue of, of, of low carbon and um, and well-being and satisfaction very well. But what's interesting about about this kind of taking us on to a next step. <coughs> um, the way that tenants fitted out White Collar Factory back in, well, it finished in 2015, was quite mixed. So some tenants uh, really embraced the um, the way that the base, the base building were design intent. So they, they kept with the passive concrete core cooling, the opening windows, the natural ventilation. Some tenants came in and put in a much more conventional false ceilings um, fan core unit fit out. Um, and I think going forward, responsible design as a base build really needs to extend right into the into the tenant 
um, scenario because it's, it's the landlord and the tenant need to come together in order to get those outcomes that were on the previous slide. Um, and to that end, BCO are also working on a revision to the guide to fit out, which John and I are both involved in. And that was last updated in 2011, so there's a lot of ground to make up there. Um, but the idea is, is really to bring together base build and fit out design. Um, so they're seen much more as a, as a continuum and we, we therefore end up, um, we're much more likely to achieve those kind of low carbon and, and well-being outcomes that we're targeting. So to finish then, um, is net zero the death of good design? Well, I think it's, it, it needs to be the death of some kinds of unrestrained good design. And I think what we need to do going forward is find a way to blend aspects of good and responsible design. And if I think we do that, then hopefully we are then on a on a road towards net zero carbon. OK. Well, thank you very much, panellists. Um, now it's over to questions. So let's kick off with one that we've got here. Um, the revised BCA criteria are about reducing power provisions and cooling loads rather than restricting design options. Does this change open up new design opportunities? And if so, what are they? Steve? I can start with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think what we're seeing in a lot of our new schemes now is that if you if you take the kind of old sort of 100, 120 watts cooling load requirement off the table and replace it with something much more limited. Rather than have being forced down a, uh, the, the kind of conventional four pipe fan core unit route, it does open up a whole load of different options. So I think, I think actually in a way, these kind of high cooling load briefs that we've been faced with for years have, have in a way sort of constrained us in an engineering sense in terms of our design options. It makes passive cooling, it makes natural ventilation much harder. Um, so as we bring these loads down, probably to something more more like what we've been actually using for a while we do open up a whole load of other options and it makes i think it makes the design challenge for our buildings much more much more interesting because it puts some of these more nuanced kind of passive solutions on the table so yeah i think i think it, it you could argue that it's it's actually removing a constraint from an engineering point of view anything else to add I, I think from an architectural point of view, it actually takes the, the whole net zero carbon thing away from the engineers when you start reducing that, because up until now, I think that the solution has been, you know, go and get somebody to calculate lots of spreadsheets and exciting things like that. But actually, the, the building envelope and, as you say, that the passive cooling and the, the potential then for, for natural ventilation and natural cooling um, is brought it back into play, whereas before we just kind of been designing um, you know, shuffling around elements on a facade rather than uh, contributing heavily in, into the into the, the the net zero carbon element of the reducing it, um, and you'll get buildings that actually respond better to their their environment and their uh, their orientation rather than the, the sort of cookie cutter wrap the whole building in the in the same envelope. So I think that will will also actually bring the architect back into the conversation yeah i think that's true actually i think, I, I think a lot of a, a lot of the a lot of the solution now you know with a, a more passive approach a lot of solution now lies in the facade and it is a much more integrated it has to be a much more integrated solution thank you all um if any questions in the audience we can and also remember and um, chat online anyone um to keep those coming through and Okay, um, I've got another one here then we can go to. Uh, so, how can we make sustainability beautiful or should we say sexy? John, you're going to go for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it probably goes back to the point of um, taking architecture away from that iconic. And when people say that somebody has designed an iconic building, it frustrates the hell out of me because you can't design an icon. A building becomes iconic. Uh, it's not designed as an icon. And if it is, it's probably going to fail. Um, but, so I think that idea that sexy buildings are iconic, actually sexy buildings are buildings that people want to be in. Um, they might not actually be that exciting from the outside. I think they have to be more exciting than the dull kind of 
boxes with punched windows that I showed because they are dull. Um, but you don't have to take the excitement out of a building to be sustainable. And actually, you can create the internal environment and then the spaces between buildings. It's not really about icons and facades at that point, I think. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've given the right answer there, but I don't think architecture needs to be sexy in that sense. I think if, if people enjoy being in the buildings and around buildings, that's how you create the 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 sexiness. Is that right? Is that, is that okay? I think it's the enjoyment, isn't it? And like yeah. like the like pleasure from like your surrounding areas, like your well-being and things like that. Yeah, I mean to a degree actually. If you don't notice it until you've been somewhere. Actually, yeah, it was a really nice place to be in. Yeah, that's kind of job done to me. Yeah, anything else to add? In terms well, of the design good. process, it's I think like not turning it into a tick box exercise. I think it's about embracing all the opportunities and working together as a as a team and getting excited about what you really um, can achieve in terms of a really interesting looking building that is also sustainable. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if you go back a few years, there were, I can think of a number of examples from the 80s and 90s of buildings that were predominantly naturally ventilated. Uh, I mean, the BRE building at Garston is one that I can think of, where the, the, the means by which the building was naturally ventilated was quite sort of obvious to the naked eye. It, you could kind of, you know, you could stand back and you could see how it works with its sort of its, its chimneys and its double facades. Um, and so if you consider engineering to be sexy, which uh, maybe I'll... <laughs> Maybe I won't. Anyway, <laughs> it's dangerous territory. Um, I, I think I think there is something quite interesting about moving to a more passive approach to design, where the way that the building works is more obvious to the naked eye. So you can kind of you can in, understand it and in, interact with it at a kind of human level. And I think that is well, I use the word interesting. Let's, let's stick with the interesting. I think the idea of using things expressively as mm. well. So actually using the structure not just to hold the building up but to have that you know, passive cooling effect and make it look interesting and not all hidden away you know the fact that we expose services now means that actually someone has to design them with a kind of view to them not just being thrown together by some guys on site and making up as they go along it has to be uh, considered which is you know create a, a more considered mm. better design more interesting space i think yeah OK, thank you very much. Um, one of the online questions. At present, there are no Neighbours certified projects in the UK. The project that we mentioned, Wellington Place, a design review certified as targeting five star, but haven't, hasn't actually yet been achieved. So do the panel think uh, this target is achievable in operation for in operation buildings today? Um, that's an interesting question and one that is debated a lot at the moment. If you look at the Australian market, um, Neighbours five, even six star buildings in quite conventional commercial settings are achievable yes so it is doable yes and i think we have to hang on to the hang on to the idea that these build we are capable of translating these buildings from design into operation without opening up a huge performance gap and losing the intent um, having said that i think as a, as a uk market we have a long way to go we are maybe a third of the way along the road to to achieving that i think inevitably the first buildings to enter the market and try and achieve their design ratings in operation will struggle um, i think you know we've learned a lot in design we're learning a lot in construction as those first neighbors buildings are now being constructed and we're working with contractors and understanding how we maintain that attempt, intent through construction um, and then the next bit then is working with our FM colleagues and understanding how we maintain that design intent through operation and that includes the tenant fit out and the base build operation as well uh, and I think that's probably the hardest bit of all so it, so we're maybe a third of the way there but the Australian market does demonstrate that it is possible and the commercial incentive um, is the thing that I think ultimately will get us there. Interesting thing that I think as well about the neighbours is is um, we look, we're talking all of our examples are generally on new build so what about you know, refurbished buildings from a net zero carbon perspective, it's going to be better that we retain the existing structure and obviously then having to replace the steel, the concrete, whatever the frame is. But how can we achieve neighbours on an existing building? It's really difficult. And so like the BCO target is saying five star, like where does that sit when we're looking at a refurbished asset rather than a, than a new build? So that's something as well that I think will be interesting to see how it develops. Um, anything, any questions popped up in the room? 
I think so, just so we can hear it on the recording. Hello, good morning. Thank you. Really interesting. Uh, one point, just quickly on the white collar factory. If you could have seen the look on the face of the project architect who coordinated the exposed servicing when he found out that there was going to be a suspended ceiling put in, you wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> um, but secondly, it's, it goes down to this point about how do we help clients see beyond what is in kind of let's you know BCA requirements when people are told. A nine by nine grid is as tight as you can go. That's what the market wants. How can we lead them onto another journey that says actually there is an alternate way of doing things? Mm -hmm. You referenced the um, Finsbury Avenue scheme, which we did the uh, the fit out for with with yourselves. And uh, I think the column grid there is a six and a half or six point seven five, which the market was saying that is you know no one's going to take it. All it takes is bringing people around and them actually appreciating the quality of the space the rigour of the grid, the delight in the building, that actually say, well, actually, there are other ways of doing this. What are the kind of, you know, what are the mechanisms are there other than taking people around existing buildings and showing other ways of doing things? Just a, a open question, really. I think taking people around is a brilliant way of, of doing it, though, isn't it? It's like, what, what better way to demonstrate that something works and for people to actually physically see it. I'm so glad you brought up the column grids because I didn't go into that in mind, but it's one of the biggest things we could do to reduce embodied carbon of the structure is to is to reduce the, the column grids. And we actually had a discussion when we were first planning this actually about how um, the design of office spaces has changed and actually people don't need huge open plan areas anymore and having those, um, the columns don't um, make the building worse, they actually add interest and the chance for internal fit out to be more interesting. But in terms of how we do it beyond um, visits, um, maybe just more examples and, um, and that being shared in the media and social media. I think it's partly that education piece. And I'm, I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure if there are any agents in the room. There are bound to be some agents online. But I think that the, the industry, and I think it's natural that we all want flexibility flexibility always means you know you know more air potentially the five-star hotel example is really good you know the fact that you can order a steak at three o'clock in the morning is a fairly irrelevant to most people but that means that there is somebody in the kitchen there with some steak and all the waste that that potentially creates um is, is having that ultimate flexibility means that the building is inefficient just like a five-star hotel is inefficient in that sense but if you i think part of it is that if you go and look at um, particularly refurbished buildings that are usually more constrained and a bit quirky actually people are now going well that's really interesting because I can put my breakout space or collaboration space in that interesting corner because people like to be there and then I can have the kind of more more generic open plan office that used to be the thing that drove absolutely all space that can be um, you can still have some of that but you don't need that ultimate flexibility of um, you know, vast open spaces and, and a nine by nine is is great but why can't you go the full 18 meters um, you know, there are lots and lots of buildings that have gone there and it's it's utterly pointless really because we are much more flexible now and nobody tends to go to the office and sit at a desk every day and the same desk so actually if you don't like that desk you can sit at another one the next time you happen to be in the office so i think i think it's about showing examples and continually talking I'll, I'll go back to agents because they're the people who often you know if you're a hassled business owner you don't you know you do a building or a fit out or something once every 10 years once in a career it's all a problem so if an agent tells you oh yeah you need this ultimate flexibility you'll probably believe them and why wouldn't you and so i think start with them and and get designers involved in those conversations earlier i mean one first thing to come to so the new bco guide um the range of of grids was in the old guide it was nine to 15 meter grid spans it's now six to 15 um and i think that's possibly the only number in that guide that i actually did have an influence on um, <laughs> So, but I, I think, I mean, I think, I, I think that the kind of the tenant market is in a really interesting place at the moment, actually, because, I mean, we're seeing, and I, you know, you can see across the market that a lot of a lot of tenant organisations, quite mainstream organisations, who now have made corporate net zero carbon commitments, and are trying now to work out what those commitments mean in terms of, in terms of their property portfolio, and that I think is in a, in the, its early days, 
and is working its way through. But the demand from tenants for net zero carbon in inverted commas space is definitely on the increase. There has been, and I think there still is a gap of understanding between a tenant saying, I want net zero carbon, and the tenant understanding that that, mean, that puts some constraints on the kind of space and the way that they use it. But what the, what the BCO guide update is doing is closing that gap a bit. I don't think it closes it completely, but it closes it a bit. Um, and I think as we go forward, that gap will have to close even more. So there's more of a challenge, but where it was all balanced towards give me everything just in case I need it. I think there is there is now a more balanced approach in the tenant in terms of tenant demand, which I think is, is a good thing and I think will drive us ultimately in the right direction. We've had a couple of online questions that kind of segue towards that point actually quite nicely. There was uh, someone's asked um, as an interior designer, I wonder how you feel about uh, Cate rather rather stopping at Shell and Core and thinking it's a waste then obviously how traditionally we're you know full Cate spec whereas actually if it's kind of vertical distribution and not horizontal it's then the agents helping to assist that kind of sell to the market to make sure that that fit out then is is not wasteful um, and I suppose is, is creating that holistic approach to the building and then there's also one that um, linked into that um, nicely saying, um, is the UK industry evolving to bring all design team members in an inception stage to achieve a better outcome from all aspects of design rather than the traditional architectural concept development, which I think is is kind of where we're heading with some of those points, really. Um, if there's anything you wanted to add on those two. Yeah, I could, I could do it on, on the Cat A, Cat B one. I think that's really interesting. And then maybe I'm sure the others will <laughs> come in on the um, some of the other points. But the um, we still do a lot of Cat A. A lot of the cat a still ends up in the bin. It is still an environmental disaster. Um, I think the, uh, there is talk in the industry, and I, I'm not sure where the BCO guidance is going on this, but there's definitely been discussion in this area uh, about trying to move away from from the kind of uniform cat a provision that is then quite often then then removed at a later date. However, the caveat to that is that more of the design responsibility therefore sits with the tenant if they're coming into effectively a shell and core space and providing their own cat a stroke b. And therefore, that integration I was talking about between the base build and the tenant design is that much more important because there is a greater risk if the tenant takes more design responsibility that those two things start to drift apart and you therefore don't get your, your energy performance or your whole life carbon outcome that you're looking for. And it's maybe actually the Cat A plus that comes into play if you're working from the beginnings and it's that more turnkey approach, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Do we have another hand in the room for a question? And with the obviously the inflation that we're suffering and the the wobbles in the sort of the the market and talk of a bit of a slowdown, how do we defend these excellent sort of net zero design principles in the face of the sort of short term economic reality? You know, I remember I've been in loads of meetings in the past where you get told that sustainability costs X percent on top of the build. You know, if you want to go to say Brian Mount Standing, it costs an extra 10 percent. Whereas on some of these examples you put up there with good design, I, I'd imagine don't really cost much more. Also, I hear that you know tenants aren't prepared to pay more rent, so the value of the, the office is not in, in, in increased with if it's net zero or, or a sustainable office building. What, how would you respond if you were stuck in a lift with a developer expressing these comments to you? What would you what sort of what would you talk about without mentioning polar bears and and David Attenborough? <laughs> I, I think that the the concept of, of sort of um, brown discount or, or green premium has been around for probably as long as the idea of you know, sustainability. I think it, there is some evidence now to show that there is a green premium and not just a brown discount. Um, I think that's probably more in London and other core cities. Probably difficult to justify everywhere, but I think certainly it's now becoming part of that highest rent in this city, certainly in Bristol, it has to be ticking those boxes. OK, we haven't got to net zero carbon yet, um, but I'd be surprised if the next scheme off the drawing board isn't Neighbours Five Star and better, because that's you just have to keep pushing it and the rents have continually risen in the last five, ten years in Bristol. So that will drive it in regional markets, I think. But the problem is at the bottom end of that market, 
the the refurbished and the sort of probably unconsidered refurbishment it's just nowhere to be seen and you step outside of those cool cities and it's even harder um because it it's not that it costs more money it's a better quality product and the market is still you know, if the market is at 20 quid a foot um there's just nothing to do even a decent quality refit um let alone a net zero carbon one so i i think it will just have to percolate down um and it's also i think stephen's saying it's, it's being driven by tenants who you know they might have a small office um and a, a, a national or multinational company will have a small office in a regional city and they just can't find anything you know we're talking to quite a few people like that and that will drive landlords to realize that they've got to do something to those buildings even if it's not net zero carbon now they've got to have a plan to get there in five years ten years to to meet those corporate requirements because i think at the moment there are probably being some free passes given to regional property managers which won't be allowed for that much longer Thank you. Add to that, though, in terms of, well, again, from a structural perspective, um, material efficiency reduces cost. And um, the example I shared was a very elaborate, beautiful example to make the point. But when we talked about the column grids, when we make smaller column grids, we reduce the total amount of material that reduces the cost and the carbon. So that's a really simple way of explaining um, to people. Um, I think. Passive house design can increase the overall cost and there it's about, I mean, it's not potentially as much as people think, but there it's about looking at the um, operational costs and doing whole life costing to be able to um, convince people that it's worth a little bit more of upfront spend and you'll see that. And as energy prices are going up, obviously that's going to um, actually make that lifetime life cycle costing um, work out better to make the investment now. Thank you. Just got time for a couple more questions. I think there's one more in the room at the back. Um, just want to get that one. Thank you. Um, so here we're assuming that we all want buildings to be net zero carbon. Um, but of course, and we're also dealing with ways and we're designing better and coming up with ways to do it better. But what if clients don't want that? So how should we deal with if we meet a client that is not interested in that? How should we convince them that they should deal with the constraints that come um, hand in hand with net zero design? And to take that point further, what if there are um, buildings or clients that don't want that? Should we still be designing those buildings or should we just not be designing any buildings that don't target net zero design. <laughs> After you. <laughs> <laughs> questions in there. Um, it's, it's a question we, we wrestle with and I'm sure our wrestle with as well. Um, whether we should refuse to take commissions that aren't targeting net zero carbon or you know, very high sustainability things. It's one that we at the moment have concluded that if you don't take those commissions, someone else will and won't won't do anything to, to push it. So I think the challenge is to take a client who is not particularly interested and push them, maybe not as far as net zero carbon, but if you can notch them up one or two rungs on the ladder towards sustainability, it's better than letting it go to someone who will just take the brief and do what the client says. But I'm not sure I'm personally not sure if that's the right thing to do. Because actually, if reputable companies continue to do that, people will still think it's OK. Um, but ultimately, everyone's got a mortgage to pay and people to keep employed. So it, it's, it's a, it, I think, is a sort of quite a difficult position to be in. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with a lot of that. I mean, our rarely comes together on a single position you know it's the nature of a, of a large diverse firm that we have different views but I mean it, we have as a firm decided that you know we're going to sort of move our weight ourselves out of the oil and gas sector so we've, we've made sort of one decision in this direction but the thing actually coming back to your, your question that interests me it's a great question by the way because I, I think it's very much of the moment um, the thing that interests me is you know I've been a sustainability consultant a long time and for most of that time it has been an uphill battle to 
persuade clients by whatever may, you know, fair means or foul that they should make their building a little bit more sustainable than they really want to, because to your point a minute ago, they're convinced whether it's true or not that it would make it more expensive. They think it puts constraints on them in other ways. They haven't always thought that it's actually particularly important for whatever reason. I don't have to make those arguments anymore. I have people banging my door down asking for the most sustainable high rise, low rise hospital, whatever, ever. Um, and the reason for that is, is partly just because, you know, people listen to David Attenborough and the, and the world's opinions have changed. But also because, you know, if you're in, a, in, in the commercial office market, if you want to have tenants in the long term, you need a you need a position on this. If you want to be able to get finance in the long term, you need a position on this. So, so there's a real kind of pincer movement coming down from the finance market and up from the tenant market. Um, as John talked about earlier, you know, there is an emerging green premium for um, more sustainable buildings in lots of ways, and net zero carbon is one of those. Um, so for most people operating in a commercial market, um, this has become a commercial incentive or a commercial necessity for a lot of people. So you don't, we do, I, I, I don't find myself making those emotive arguments very much as, as much as I used to. And even if you think about the university sector, you know, if you want to attract students to your university, you need a really strong um, environmental policy. I mean, my son's 17 and he's looking at all this at the moment and it's on his mind as it should be. He's had a very challenging conversation with him about what, what net zero carbon means, but I won't go into that now. Um, so I, I think I, I think the pressure is really mounting on all sectors of the um, of, of, of property. Um, so it's much more about I have a you know I'm being told that I need to be the most sustainable stroke net zero and I need to know how to do it and that's the question we're being asked much more, thankfully. So the 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 number of clients coming to us who really aren't interested and want to do something different is diminishing. And ultimately, it's legislation, right? It's being pushed. There's the, the, the legislative drive that will all our hands will be forced to do it, so there won't be a choice. We also don't have if a client has given us a, a net zero carbon brief, it doesn't mean that as a design team we can't still aim for that. Mm. And actually, in our group, we do. We will try and set a target regardless of of the brief because we can do that. As I said, we can do that without putting the price up, and we will do carbon comparisons regardless of what the client wants. Um, but I do agree that, well, we we can take clients on the journey and try and educate the clients that are not currently there yet. So I but I think more we should make the choices on the actual type of project. Um, and so it's um, if it's a project, the client that doesn't believe in sustainability, but the project has potential to be sustainable. Great. But um, it's about choosing and that, you know, you point about not being an oil and gas as a company, then that doesn't look good, does it, if we are um, saying that sustainability is everything to us. Thank you. Um, I think that's probably all we've got time for on the questions. So just to wrap things up, I think we have managed to cover what good design looks like and how net zero carbon impacts things in both a positive and a negative way. Um, but ultimately, I think the takeaway from today is that perhaps we shouldn't really look at net zero carbon in isolation. And if we do, we'll miss out on important design aspects like well-being, functionality, flexibility, longevity and beauty. Um, thank you all very much for attending today, both in person and virtually. The next Arab Breakfast event will be covering the topic of housing to repurpose or to retrofit, covering perspectives of delivering large scale housing retrofit for net zero. That's going to be in September, um, hosted in London, and I think there'll be a similar online um, webinar as there has been today. And also, if you could keep an eye out on the BCO website for more seminars in the ESG series um, that uh, the committee are uh, circulating. And that's it from us. Thank you again and enjoy the rest of your day.